Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. And today I will talk about uh, Wolf Boot and how we do secure boot and remote firmware updates, uh, and especially in the context of uh, safety critical embedded systems. Obligatory company introduction for those of us, uh, for those of you who don't know us. Uh, we've been on the market for about 19 years now, been founded in 2004. Um, last change name of 2014, when uh, some of you might remember us uh, with one of our older names, EISSL or CYSSL. And uh, of course, our main area of focus is um, security, and all our products are available as open source uh, under a GPL license, and, and of course, uh, a commercial license. Uh, which is a proprietary license uh, for those who cannot comply with the, with the GPL terms. And, uh, uh, and of course, we provide uh, professional support from the same people who author the code. Um, our main areas of focus are data addressed, so cryptography, encryption, authentication, and uh, data in transit, uh, TLS, uh, SSH, and other secure protocols. And this is done in a transport agnostic way, so we are able to run those protocols not only as recommended on top of a TCPIP stack, but often in embedded environment means also running over custom transport. And uh, more recently, um, like uh, six years ago, we started researching on uh, secure boot and firmware updates, and now we have um, part of our products addressing uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, challenges on the market. And uh, the, the, this, is, this third part is the main topic we will be talking about today. This is a bit an overview of uh, our product line. Um, of course, Wolf SSL is uh, what we are most known for, and that's a lightweight SSL TLS library, which is 20 times smaller in size than OpenSSL. And uh, it relies on WolfCrypt, which is our crypto engine, uh, which has been certified for different uh, scenarios, both in security, so for what concerns FIPS 140-2 and the ongoing FIPS 140-3 certification, and of course, in um, safety critical applications up to uh, life critical scenarios, so up to uh, the 0178 c dal a uh, which means that our Crypto algorithms are um, allowed to run on airborne software, um, as we we were discussing about this in the previous talk. Um, so, where safety critical um, the restrictions are, yeah, very strict on up down to the single line of codes and coverage and uh, uh, documentation of the specifics, etc. We won't go into many details there, but. Uh, this is a core component that, uh, that we will consider today. On top of that, we um, distribute other um, application layer libraries, such as Wolf MQTT, which is a lightweight MQTT client, which is, of course, by default, secured with TLS. Wolf SSH, which is a uh, client server implementation of SSH uh, that can run on uh, very small microcontrollers, uh, including SFTP, uh, so you can transfer files uh, uh, on a device without a file system, even by providing your virtual implementation of uh, sending and receiving files uh, through simple callbacks. Then we have a TPM library that's uh, uh, allowing uh, simple communication with the TPM devices, which become more and more popular as uh, HSM in the embedded market. Um, and then Wolfboot, which is a main topic today, and uh, Wolf IDPS, uh, Wolf Center, which is our IDPS, uh, which is uh, uh, our newest protocol. Um, we do provide many language wrappers, because many people like to use us on both sides. Uh, so cloud endpoints can also implement Wolf SSL uh, on different programming languages, like C Sharp, Python, of course, Java. Um, we have a JCC that's used in Android devices, and and the last line there is a series of um, open source 
command line tools or other libraries that we support, uh, which curl is uh, worth mentioning because the author and maintainer of curl, Dennis Stenberg, uh, is part of our team. So we can also provide professional support on curl, which is uh, non-GPL, as you might know. So let's talk about secure boot. What we mean with secure boot in simple terms is we want to be sure that uh, the software that's running on our target uh, is what we expect it to be, and especially that it's coming from a trusted source. We will see how this is possible with the means of cryptography, of standard cryptography, and uh, how we avoid any adversary to run malicious code or raw code on, on our target devices, which is important. So a secure bootloader is a component that's, that sits in a, our device. Sometimes, most of the time, it's immutable. Sometimes it can also be upgraded through secure means. And that's exactly this. This is the main task. So ensures that uh, no one runs code that's not authorized. So how do you write a secure bootloader nowadays? Uh, writing it from scratch, that's still our biggest competitor on the market. So companies that start their own secure bootloader uh, as a component, and they say, yeah, it's just a secure boot. How hard can it be? And the thing that uh, is always a hidden cost there is testing all the corner cases. It's what, what can go wrong in, uh, mm, in cases that you haven't foreseen uh, during your design, which means that it, it adds a lot, a lot of effort to your engineering team to, to start a project like this on your own. It might seem simple because it's not a large project. It's a, a few thousand lines of code. By definition, it must be as small as possible. And there are also a few other things you have to consider, uh, key management, key deploy, and uh, how you sign and very how you sign your firmware before sending it to your target, and so it's a set of tools that are needed by the secure boot in general, but uh, are often not taken into account enough. Uh, so the same way you shouldn't write your own TLS library or your own TCP IP stack probably if you have already options for that, unless of course you have good reasons for it. Uh, why would you write your uh, secure bootloader, especially for a, a safety-critical environment? Uh, so we came up with a more genetic solution, uh, at least. A consideration on safety versus security. Um, safety does not imply security by default. And this is a hard lesson that uh, some verticals have learned uh, Pretty recently, for instance, uh, space agency that are on, among the top class safety scenarios for the quality of the software that they deliver don't take enough into account the risks of cybersecurity. Uh, you say cybersecurity in space, but uh, okay, um, Russia has stolen a satellite from Viasat the day before they started the war. So this is real life threat scenario. And your adversities can be very powerful. But this is also true in both directions. So uh, safety does not imply security, but also security does not by default imply safety. You can have a very secure TLS stack or a very secure crypto implementation that takes into account all the uh, attack models, but that is not taking into account safety. So there are actual examples where secure code must be following the, the guidelines and the, uh, and the certifications for the specific vertical, for instance, the 0178C, which means also dynamic allocations are not allowed. The execution flow must be predictable. And uh, the ancient mentality is if, 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 if it ain't broken, don't fix it. But we should start thinking in terms of when something breaks, we should have been already prepared to fix and patch it, even if it's running uh, on the field. So for this, we provide the secure bootloader in a way that it can support your firmware updates. And for this, there has been, 
for many years a draft in the IETF that's called SUIT, uh, it's a software update for the Internet of Things, which targets many small devices and, uh, and say how to protect the, um, the, secure, the, the secure boot process. And the guidelines there are very clear, and this has been turned into RFC 1919 in April 2021, so pretty recently, so way after we started this project. So those are guidelines that are officially uh, part of the IATF recommendation. And these requirements, of course, are clear, especially in the small parts, are keeping your attack surface very small, and especially dealing with public key infrastructure when authenticating your firmware. And uh, that's where Wolfwood was born and uh, was written in C uh, for bare metal use. It has small footprint, so it can run on any embedded devices. Uh, the smallest one, it's about 10 kilobytes right now. Uh, it has to be memory safe, so malloc and free don't exist in our uh, bootloader space. Uh, we have simple partitioning scheme, and that's a, we abstracted the HAL, so we made it very portable, just six functions to port to your favorite target, and we already support tens of those. And we have different booting strategies and partition selection strategy or firmware selection strategies that depend on the architecture of your target, of course. We do also provide key tools um, for generating uh, keys and signing the firmware and encrypting the firmware. Uh, when needed uh, on the host side. And, uh, and of course, the design is still based on the RFC 1919. Uh, this is also because at Wolf SSL, we don't invent anything. We don't write our own specification. We just implement what's specified in the standards. And this is valid also for TLS and uh, all the cryptography modules. Um, the main features of Wolfwood, of course, it relies on Wolfcrypt, so our crypto engine that's FIPS 140-2 certified, so it does exactly what FIPS uh, specifies for uh, cryptography. And uh, it, it has a version that's DO178C-A certified of all the crypto algorithms that, uh, that we use in Wolfboot. So it's easy to have a Wolfboot that's DO178C up to DAL-A uh, on airborne devices, for instance. Uh, we have a public key-based root of trust, which is not really a root of trust. It's what the RFC is called a trust anchor because it's just a public key. And uh, we support mul multiple keys with, with multiple um, associations to different uh, um, uh, partitions or uh, firmwares. Uh, the bootloaders uh, can handle updates, um, of course, and that it has a, a fallback mechanism. So even if your firmware has been authenticated, but it contains a bug, it's able to revert it to the, to the previous version, so your device is not bricked forever. And it has also power fail protection, so if the most critical operations, for instance, swapping two partitions uh, is interrupted to, to power loss, for instance, uh, you are sure that the update will be completed at the next startup because uh, there's always two copies of the same sector that's been moved at that point, and the flags keep track in a redundant way of the update uh, process. Um, we support external flash memories, SPIs on small microcontrollers up to any kind of uh, non-volatile memory, even SATA drives. Um, and we do support bootloader self-update. It's just a unique feature. So we can upload a bootloader while it's running. This is not very fail-safe, so it's considered more an emergency situation. So you should consider the implications when using this, because, of course, that's a, a bootloader updating itself while it's running. Uh, but it works pretty well. We do support encrypted updates. Uh, this is mostly to... Um, ensure that uh, the, the firmware that's stored on an external device cannot be intercepted uh, if it's encrypted, uh, for instance, by wiretapping uh, an SPI device or other physical attacks. And we do support uh, Delta updates, also in combination with the above, uh, which allows, for instance, on the thin network protocols with low bandwidth to just transfer 
the necessary amount of bytes to switch from one version to the next. For instance, you're just publishing a bug fix, and uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time and bandwidth to update your target. So you just send the, the binary difference between the two. And it's, of course, supported also by the tools that sign and create the manifest header. Wolfboot, as I said, is very portable and supports multiple targets. The project has started originally on ARM Cortex-M and was mostly oriented to microcontrollers. But then we, we saw that the paradigm was also, um, of course, applicable to uh, richer targets like, like uh, ARM Cortex-A or Intel x86, 32-bit uh, and 64, where we currently have the possibility to replace Intel Slimboot uh, with a much thinner implementation that can be certified because, as you might know, DO 178 for instance, but other, other safety regulations uh, have a cost of certification which is directly uh, related to the, to the numbers of lines of code and, uh, and the complexity of the project itself. So we keeping it simple and small. And of course, RISC V uh, RV32 with the 64-bit RISC V port uh, coming up and uh, PowerPC uh, 32 and 64-bit, which is mostly oriented to the automotive market. We don't have yet a MIPS port, but that's also in, in our um, um, roadmap. The way we do key management is pretty simple. We generate the key pair once you are your, the owner of your own private key, which stays in your premises, on your cloud server, or whatever build system you're using to distribute your firmware updates. And as soon as this private key is safe, um, you don't have to worry about the security of the entire um, secure boot process. So even if your fleet, uh, your devices have a public key stored in a trust anchor, um, leaking that key, by definition, it's a public key, so it won't impact uh, on, uh, on the security of the, of the secure boot process for, for the fleet. Um, the public key is, is, as I said, stored on the target. Uh, it can be stored in different ways. Uh, it must be accessible by the bootloader. Um, we don't provide by default uh, um, um, a revocation mechanism uh, of those keys, but of course, if you're storing them in a dedicated partition that's also upgradable, you can do that. By default, Wolfboot includes the, the key store in its own binary, so it, it can revocate the key just by using the key the last time to do a, a bootloader update, for instance. That's a, a scenario that we've seen um, uh, among our customers. And the same tool, what it basically does is attaches a manifest header to the image, and uh, this manifest header contains metadata and all the information about the, the firmware, um, including the signature and the hash verification of the um, on the firmware itself. Um, and yeah, as, it, as, it, as we said, it's a, a trust anchor rather than a tr root of trust. And the difference is that the trust anchor, according to RFC 6024, uh, it is a representation of a public key. So the only requirement there is that it's not uh, writable by an attacker, because of course, this means that an attacker can put his own public key, uh, which in turn, means that the attacker could load uh, the um, rogue uh, firmware there. So the way you store the trust, the trust anchor in your device is very important. For this, we usually um, rely on manufacturers' um, storage, one-time uh, uh, one writable storage or specific hardware security modules, or even the TPM itself uh, with the locking mechanism, uh, which is based on measure boot. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So sometimes we use flash readout protection from manufacturers, uh, which is sufficiently secure for most use cases, but we must know that this kind of uh, uh, trust anchor are um, often um, subject to hardware attacks like glitch. And um, so 
it's sometimes not sufficient, depending on your, on your, uh, on your risk analysis, of course. And uh, if you implement that through secure elements, uh, of course, your, the security of your trust anchor increases there. And we do provide support also for third-party provisioning, uh, which means that uh, if you have a contract with uh, a company that's uh, uh, managing your uh, private keys, uh, our tools can uh, um, uh, offload the operation of uh, signing uh, when, uh, when signing the firmware, and on the other hand, the manufacturer of your other security module can install Trust Anchor that are specific per device and uh, can be done in factory, and that's, that's, usually, um, th that's usually one of the most secure uh, trust anchor solutions there. So as we said, we generated the, the, the key ones, the key is of course a key pair, can be CC, RSA, uh, ED25519, ED448, and then the, private key, the public key is embedded in your target and uh, the private key is used uh, to sign the firmware uh, on a server and then uh, the authenticated firmware is sent to the device and uh, authenticated by Wolfboot. So we do offer two possible boot strategies. Um, of course, uh, AB approach is when two partitions have the same uh, uh, value. So you can boot your kernel from uh, uh, either of them, and uh, one of them is always available for receiving updates, and that's, uh, that's only feasible uh, on richer devices where you have an MMU, for instance, uh, and you can uh, run your kernel as a position independent, uh, uh, like for instance on uh, embedded Linux devices. Uh, but of course, for my controller, due to uh, executing place uh, restrictions, this is not possible. So we do have a boot update approach, which is based on a, a swap uh, partition, which is exactly um, uh, as large as a, uh, one sector of your non-volatile memory, and and. Every time you receive an update uh, that can be verified, uh, there will be a swap between the boot and update partition. So at that point, the new firmware becomes the booting firmware, and uh, the old firmware is stored in the update partition temporarily until we can confirm that the new firmware is working from the application side. And uh, yeah, and of course, uh, this is also needed because we can store updates, as I, as I previously mentioned, encrypted and uh, in an external SPI device, uh, also microcontrollers, and we can't really execute in place from there. And executing in place from a different partition on the internal flash will mean that we need to know at compile time what is the booting address for that. So on an embedded microcontroller, what normally we do is Dedicate a small partition at the beginning, uh, which contains a bootloader, and we have a boot partition, an update partition, uh, which might live on the same internal flash, or the update partition uh, can be also moved to, the, to, the, to an external NVM. And a swap partition that can be as small as the flash physical sector size, which is used for redundancy during uh, the swap operations to guarantee the, the, the power fail safe uh, feature. On, uh, Richer systems like embedded Linux uh, or um, uh, position independent kernels, uh, we do use the AB election. So if uh, firmware exists in both partitions, uh, we're going to select the one with the latest version. Of course, as long as both can be verified. And then uh, prepare the execution for uh, the specific machine. So we're talking about ARM64 or x86, where there has to be some preparation done, um, also, for instance, uh, for the ex execution level, the ring level, and uh, the interrupt routing uh, uh, for more complex uh, systems. And of course, the update strategy is not always the same. It's very simple. It's about 100 lines of code. There are more variants, and we keep adding those. And uh, it, it is really a uh, um, birth view of the, the, the Wolf Boot components can be recombined according to the specific uh, use case. 
So in the simple use case, on a microcontroller, at first we, we flash Wolf put in the, mm, on its own partition, and then we deploy the factory firmware that's signed as version one. And this is the uh, like normal first boot, where Wolf boot will authenticate. So at this point, we don't need the JTAG, because we can disable that. And uh, Wolf boot authenticate the current firmware and boot into, uh, boots into that. And, uh, that's normal operating condition. But then you can transfer an update there and uh, sign and transmit the firmware update, uh, which is received with any protocol, because really this depends on the application, also according to RFC. And uh, the firmware that's uh, up uploaded there will be then verified. And uh, if it's valid and it has a version number that's bigger than the current one, uh, the two images will be swapped. So the previous firmware sits there in the update partition, as I was previously mentioning, so that if something goes wrong, we can always um, swap it again and uh, return the, the target to the initial situation before the update started. Uh, the next boot, of course, we are back to the situation uh, with, with the newer firmware, so the firmware will still be authenticated before booting all the time. Let's talk about the fail-safe countermeasures, uh, as how we call it, the million dollar brick avoidance. Um, we have a very predictable flow. There is no dynamic, dynamic memory, heap is banned, of course. That prevents uh, the common silly error in embedded, like uh, st so historically silly error, like uh, heap stack collisions. Our interrupts are all off, and that's, that has to do, again, with a predictable flow. So we don't want surprises. If we are not using devices, we keep, we, if not using peripherals, we keep them off. And if we have to use them, we do prefer a slower polling approach rather than IQ where interrupts can happen at any point in the code and would also imply more non-predictable flows. And uh, so we have a compile time defined behavior for both the flows, possible, uh, and uh, the memory allocation. And this is, of course, possible because WolfScript can be compiled without any memory allocate, with any dynamic memory allocation, and we can measure the stack space used at compile time. The power failure uh, safe swap. Uh, means that the power, as I was saying, can be interrupted uh, and microcontroller can be reset at the worst possible moment during the swap operation, and the swap will be uh, uh, resumed from the point. Uh, yeah. Confirming the update or rolling back to previous version is something that you have to integrate in your application or operating system. So. For instance, when the device is available again to be reachable uh, through the network, you can call the Wolf Boot success function, which sets a flag um, in the flash or in the um, NVM uh, device that you're using, uh, saying that that firmware is actually booting. It's not just verified, it's also working, which is usually important. And at that point, uh, we can discard the old firmware that was stored in a, um, in the, in, temporarily in the update partition. We, of course, have more unique features. Uh, we talked about that update. Uh, that reduces the update size, reduces the transfer size. It has two levels of authentication, because first we authenticate the authenticate patch, and then we apply the patch, and we authenticate again the resulting image. And uh, the revert is always possible uh, without any overhead uh, from the storage point of view, because we do have um, two ways patch, so we have the patch is actually twice as big as the difference because it contains uh, the differences between uh, one and two and two and one. And we do have actual side channel and glitch attacks mitigation. This has been a very long research and a very difficult set of patches. It's uh, adding uh, quite a big amount of uh, uh, volatile architecture-specific assembly but it has been tested on Cortex-M against voltage clock fault injections, uh, electromagnetic fault injections, uh, actual attacks that we have seen happening 
to one of our partners, uh, New AE in, in Canada, which is specializing on this. While other similar products uh, in the open source world claim to have this, but we have proven that those countermeasures are absolutely ineffective uh, on MCU boot, for instance, even if MCU boot claims to have those. And of course, a bootloader self-update. We haven't seen this feature on any other bootloader. We can authenticate multiple images, so it's not just uh, the, um, the booting firmware, but you can have, for instance, a configuration partition that has a different set of keys. Uh, we work on um, Cortex uh, um, uh, um, ARMv8 uh, M uh, to have separation so you can update secure and non-secure uh, domains. And, um, and we have a simple key store that has flags uh, that uh, it's a mask of permission that says which key can be used to authenticate which partition. So this is extremely flexible if you have a model with multiple parties involved uh, distributing uh, software for uh, for the same uh, target uh, in a secure way. And of course, once you sign a firmware with one of the available private keys, the bootloader will automatically select the associated public key because in the manifest we do have a hint. Now, just briefly before concluding, uh, uh, let's see what kind of uh, challenges the bootloader uh, alone solves. So it's, uh, the tasks accomplished here are providing a secure and reliable update mechanism, uh, key management tools, de uh, detect and discard potential attacks, uh, or forged non-attentive firmware, uh, the managing interaction with the hardware, and uh, um, manage the storage uh, where the updates are stored, etc. What we don't do at the bootloader level is preventing firmware updates to be intercepted, for instance, or ensure that only authorized devices uh, get the firmware that we're sending over, uh, because of course uh, it's not authenticating itself. So these are the challenges that are left to the secure transfer part. And of course this can be done, we suggest to be done on, uh, with, with standard secure protocols, so anything that, that you do should be always covered by um, secure protocols, uh, uh, DTLS, TLS, uh, and you know any com components uh, that we provide, as I said, are not related to a specific transport, so ca they can be used in in peculiar and uh, niche protocols as well. We have customers updating uh, firmware through CAN bus um, in a car, still using TLS over it, as if it was TCP. So you can see here we have an entire ecosystem of components. Uh, we just seen uh, Wolf boot and the secure boot and firmware updates part uh, in this talk, but uh, of course we can integrate all, all those components uh, to, to provide a complete firmware update uh, with those additional security requirements uh, where they, they're um, available. And this concludes my talk, but uh, I'll be gladly answer some questions if you have one. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. I have a couple of questions. Just let me get my notes here. Sure. Uh, first of all, the encryption uh, and signature uh, algorithms you employ are, do you offer any quantum resilient uh, versions of them? Yes, we do. We haven't integrated yet in Wolfboot, but uh, Wolfcrypt already has uh, a few of those algorithms that were finalists in the, uh, in the NIST selection. Um, some of them are only available through uh, LibOQS, so they right. imply that, that you need the POSIX system for it. But we do have initial implementation of the Lithium, I think, uh, or Falcon, uh, that, that's, that's running on a Embedded device, so it is in our 2023 roadmap to integrate those uh, uh, to have an example of uh, post quantum safe security cryptography uh, for the authentication part. For the encryption, we are less worried. Okay. Because we believe AES is still quantum safe. Okay. Um, and how flexible is Wolf Boot for 
custom signatures and or crypto algorithms? Um, how easy is it to extend if uh, one would need uh, their own, uh, if you have requirements on other? The manifest header is, uh, is, is documented and it's basically a TLV. So you okay. can add your own tag and there is right. a tag for the authentication algorithm. Right. So you just extend the value for those, and that's how we have built up. So the initial version had only ED25519 that we, we expanded to ACC uh, with different key sizes and same right. for RSA, and we recently added ED448. Um, All right. All right. Uh, another question about the Delta updates. Uh, how do you solve that uh, when you have uh, encrypted uh, flash storage? Yes, that's a, so basically it works like this. Uh, the delta is built on uh, the clear text images and then it's afterward it's signed and then it's encrypted. Right. So it's uh, decrypt, uh, uh, verify, reassemble and verify. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I had a question about physical attacks, but uh, saw you mentioned it in the slides about we glitch attacks it. and clock skew and stuff. Yeah. And final comment was uh, a third uh, way of doing software update where you have a single partition, which is your main partition and the only one that is supposed to be running. And then you have a rescue partition or a disaster recovery uh, partition. Is that something? Thing you would uh, support as well, or is it in the roadmap? Yes, no, that's 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 something that a customer has asked as a customization, which we haven't published just because they were doing it on two different microcontrollers at the same time, so it was quite <laughs> peculiar. But uh, as I said, the main uh, update function is just 100 lines of code, and you can okay. write your own just by assembling the various pieces as they, if they were Legos. So it's like uh, you can decide when to do integrity check, verification check, and uh, where to copy what, or decrypt to RAM. And we do have internal APIs in Wolfboot uh, that can be used for that. And actually, you could also not use Wolfboot as bootloader and use Wolfboot as a library because of this. Because uh, uh, I see you have the possibility to use the verification function, which gives you the opportunity to use our host tools, and you still have uh, a bootloader on an architecture we don't yet support. Okay. And one final question. Uh, uh, have you done any research in systems which employ red-black separation? Uh, yes. We do have uh, a good track record on uh, Xilinx Zinc Plus, uh, platform uh, where we do integrate with uh, with their first stage bootloader, and Wolfboot is employed as a second stage bootloader on the application processor. And in that case, the provisioning is left to the FSBL, and uh, there the red black keys strategy of the manufacturer is respected. And we're working uh, uh, in, with with similar uh, approaches using the the CAM driver from NXP devices like uh, MX6 and MX8. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is Opti supported out of the box, or is that uh, up to the user? Opti, you say? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a subsequent stage for us, right? So it's a, we are not yet managing uh, any trust zone A uh, functionality. So we would just authenticate Opti as if it was a normal operating system or any other hypervisor there and, uh, and give control to that. Uh, what we can do to assist there is uh, selecting the execution level that's, that's needed by, by your configuration, which in case of Opti, I guess it will be the, the highest one, so, so you can run it as an hypervisor. So there's no built-in way to use it as hardware key management? Uh, not, not at the moment. We haven't had re requests uh, from the market on this. We are okay, cash and code company, so as soon as the use case <laughs> comes up. Lots of questions. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, about the uh, incremental updates uh, that you have a two-way patch. So uh, you have the patch forward and also the patch backwards to, um, for Correct. the rollback. But in, a case, in case of a security update, uh, you really don't want to be able to roll back because uh, you will roll back to an unsecured system. Correct. So, so there is a way to disable it, uh, just say that this is a security update. Either you uh, apply it and it works or 
just stop because maybe there is uh, an attack in place uh, and the system is not secure anymore? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. But uh, the actual rollback, it's a controlled rollback. So in, in normal use case, we never uh, allow rolling back to a previous version that's coming from an update. But when we roll back that delta or not is because we were not able to confirm that the firmware is actually working. So you, you don't want a brick. So if you were able to send a valid firmware image that can be validated and authenticated, but maybe one of your engineers has introduced a, a critical bug into that and your device is not reachable anymore, hopefully you put your WAF boot success point uh, in, your, in your code where the device can be reachable. So if that function is not called and you reboot again, for instance, through a watchdog, uh, the bootloader will have to have a way to roll back to, to the previous version. But that's the only case when this is allowed. And it's clear in the code when this operation is allowed or not. And this is also glitch protected. OK, thank you. Um, is this supposed to be complementary with uh, ARM trusted firmware, or is it like a replacement for ARM trusted firmware? Uh, we aim to be a replacement for uh, ARM trusted firmware at a certain point. There is a branch already doing that, and uh, the reason for it is that we want to provide WolfCrypt uh, as a crypto module. So we're still deciding how many APIs to support. For now, we support our own callback mechanism with our own API function names. Uh, and uh, uh, PKCS 11, and thinking about PSA as well. Um, but we don't have enough attention from the market to implement PSA at this time. And, uh, but yeah, eventually uh, we do have a branch that's public, and you can see it on, on our GitHub, where we are heavily working on this. And we think that by the end of the year, we'll have a uh, hypervisor version that can, uh, can be a replacement for TFM and a safety critical one. Great, thank you. I think time is up and we need to switch to the next session. So stay for the next session, uh, RT Linux in safety critical applications. Thank you everyone, thanks. <laughs>